First of all, uh, this I have a very serious question about a very serious thing, and, and this is not a teaching. There will be no lessons or wisdom in this. This is a serious question about a real thing. What is this? Can anybody see it? No. Acorn. 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 They're all over the place. Did you know that? Okay. From oak trees. Okay. But see, I've seen them and they're green. This one's brown. Are those both acorns? So it's an acorn. That's the word we have for it. And it's going to be an acorn forever, right? Well, it might be an oak tree. An oak tree. Are there any stages in between? No. Stop. What did I say? No mystical schmystical. Unless you're Chumash, Tonga, or Gabriano, then you make it into food. Ah. And there's a bunch of steps in between. So is it a tree when it's... So this thing becomes a tree eventually. Is it a tree when it's four feet tall? Well, it's a sapling. Sapling. Okay. Is it a sapling when it's 20 feet tall? That's an oak tree. Wow, I've really asked the right people. That's really, wow. You know, it seems like what you're telling me is that language is an incredibly imprecise, tangential, conventional, purely practical, agreed upon hunch. It's like a system of symbols that only work if we agree on them. And they're completely contingent upon time, place, culture, etc. There are some people who can't even, couldn't even make that word sound, acorn. And like my dear, dear friend Tim pointed out, if you're in a different language group, not only does it not have that word sound, but it's a completely different object. It's not something that I stub my toe on in the night, it's something I make into food. That's wild. Oh well, I'm sure there's a lesson in there somewhere. <laughs> On to the teaching. I've got to write that down, that's good. Acorn, okay. <laughs> My sincere gratitude for all beings throughout all time, especially all the Bodhisattva staff members here, whose diligent service make this place a healing mountain refuge. My sincere gratitude, humility, and eternal service to all of my teachers, including Jokai Roshi, Tim Callahan, Judah Pupsanim, Mr. Rogers, and James Lowe. It is from a sincere place of joyful obedience that I give this talk tonight. May all assembled here, human and non-human, including the three treasures and all beings, find it pleasing. Is there anyone in the room who doesn't know the term three treasures or what it means? Triple gem, okay. Three jewels, okay. This is like a, an, uh, an, a very ancient way of talking about the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So the Buddha, his teachings, and the community. And of course there's expanded meanings and little teeny tiny meanings. But uh, in the dining hall, we recite that amazing chant that gets me every time. And talking about we take this food for the three jewels. And the three treasures, actually, is what it says down there. But anytime there's three and something valuable afterwards, what it means. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. And there's lots of beautiful expanded meanings, but I was like, you know, I bet there's people here who don't know what that means. Thank you. Uh, disclaimers. I will now proceed to use two highly charged and controversial words in my talk tonight. First, I'm going to say the word love. Um, I might say it a few times. Uh, I challenge you to listen to this talk and tell me that I'm not actually talking about love. Second, I'll use the word emptiness in this talk. Not only do I really not understand that word or anything about it, uh, some excellent students of the Buddha way do not care for it, and I appreciate that. But remembering that all words, signs, and symbols are fundamentally empty, have no ultimate true essence or meaning, having only conventional, convenient, and practical meaning within a language system. I'll just go ahead and use them. I'm also sure that you will see that anything I say tonight carries all the shortcomings of the above that we previously went through. 
and as I hope to transmit the view that any teaching at all is a reflection of the one speaking and my small beginning understanding and is an expression of compassion, of care, of joyful obedience. So, when I use those words, those highly contested words, please feel free to substitute any of the following words for emptiness. Boundlessness, openness, maha prajnaparamita, dharmakaya, Buddha mind, the deathless, the indestructible, the tofu with peanut sauce, or any words of your choice. What? <laughs> tofu with peanut? That's silly. <clears throat> but so delicious. That was probably one of the best things I've ever had in my entire life. That was amazing. Um, and it would probably be a very simple thing to accurately, accurately convey to someone who didn't actually have it at lunch what it was like, right? Really easy. Like, um, I can't wait to tell my wife all about it. I'll say it was peanutty, like um, Captain Crunch or peanut brittle. And I'll say it was oily, like salad dressing. That doesn't sound very good. That's weird. Hmm. Well, anyway, back to the talk. The fundamental wisdom of experience, the utterly ineffable nature of the boundless unfolding of emptiness is the crown jewel of all Dharma. I don't know what that means, but it sounds right. But I do know that it is embodied and reflected in countless functionally infinite ways through all the teachers of the Dharma, their students, their students, the teaching traditions they represent, every word in those traditions and truly speaking through every human being, animal, particle, and moment instance of this entire cosmic manifestation throughout all time. Whatever that is, is being embodied and reflected through all of these participants. And I, for one, want to applaud them. They're doing great. You're all doing great. Tim said something tonight that cracked me open. I wasn't expecting it. I wanted to sit close so I could hear it, hear his talk. And then he went and did something. He said, this whole world is a gate. Why don't you come in? And I started ugly crying in the front row. <laughs> and I was like, would it be weirder to sit here and ugly cry or weirder to run to the back of the room to not make a scene? <laughs> so... Thank you. This emptiness, boundlessness is the basis and substratum of everything, the womb of everything, or so we are told. But how to talk about such a thing? How to talk about such a thing? How to talk about something that is the substratum, substance, origin, resting place of everything? It's even harder to talk about than tofu peanut sauce. <laughs> Emptiness is the, oh, bless you, thank you. Emptiness is the space around and within which everything is born, the Great Mother. Emptiness is the silence before, between, around, within, and after all sounds, symbols, words have fallen silent. To our very great good fortune, we've had amazing Dharma talks nonstop from the time we got here until right about now. And I was so happy that Jumpa initiated all of us into the almost simplest Prajnaparamita sutras possible, the awe. Ah. And now I will initiate you into one even simpler. The silence before. Now the person who first instituted this is of course the historical Buddha. Why? If you've ever heard of the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, I love saying that fast. <laughs> if you've ever heard of that sutta, it's also called the Sutta of the Turning of the Wheel. Uh, 
Dharma wheel turning, the first turning, the first teaching, the first sermon. This is the first time the Buddha actually taught people. And there's so much to say about that. But we are told in a different sutta, the sutta of the noble quest, we are told that after his awakening, after his breakthrough, he was silent for several weeks, 49 days to cite some sources. Utterly silent. In this Noble Quest Sutta, the Buddha relates his experience just after his awakening, his breakthrough, and what led up to him actually teaching, actually opening his mouth. Does anyone know what the Buddha specifically named in the Noble Quest Sutta? why he was reticent, why he was resisting teaching. What's the thing he said about what am I supposed to say to these people? The teaching that he was most racking his brain around. And remember, we're translating raw experience into words. So we're already a world away. And then we're translating maybe Arda Magadhi, Maybe the Buddha spoke that into Pali. So that's a whole other world away. Dot, 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 dot. You get this game we're playing, right? But in the Noble Quest Sutta, the Buddha says, I, I hesitated to teach. I found it impossible to figure out how to teach Paticca Samuppada, interdependent correlation interdependent arising. Everyone know this term? Interdependent co-arising or dependent arising or dependent co-arising or as the uh, venerable Thich Nhat Hanh says, interbeing. Really briefly, everything is made of everything else. Grab anything. Oh, <laughs> my old friend, my old nemesis. This is the entire cosmos in miniature. This is not an acorn seed only. This is an acorn, this is an oak tree. Amazing how it gets a name change. It's an oak tree. It's every oak tree. It's the sun and the moon and the stars and gravity and quarks and water and soil and time and every human who's ever lived on the planet. And it doesn't take much to get there. It's pretty quick. Just touch anything. So even calling this thing a thing and giving it a name is on one level rather silly because it's actually the entire cosmos. To our very, very great good fortune, the Buddha decided to teach. And the first people he taught were his old companions. And luckily for us, the Buddha did not come with an agenda. He did not walk to his old friends thinking, I'm going to set these suckers straight. I'm going to sort them out. These guys don't get it. I'm going He was able to immediately ascertain what was going on. And it was probably pretty obvious. You know, you're walking up to a group of people and they won't look at you. They don't offer you a seat as is, was traditional in India wouldn't offer him water to wash his hands and feet. He knew what was going on. And out of his total availability, out of his profound compassion, he taught them this exact teaching about where they were maybe getting hung up. And we'll leave that teaching for another day, but he knew exactly what they needed to hear the moment he interacted with them. Without a plan, without an agenda, without a, a pamphlet or a newsletter or a banner. Spontaneously meeting them exactly where they were. And then the Buddha didn't stop 
for some, according to some sources, he taught for 49 years. That's a neat little symmetry, silent for 49 days, teaching for 49 years. Teaching up to and including his final breath. And why? Because wisdom and compassion go together? Because there are two sides of the same coin? Because wisdom, when it's on this side of the fence, looks like compassion looks like love. A whole life spent teaching was his great compassion for the world. Now a brief note about compassion. It is commonly taught that compassion is in response to suffering. In fact, you know, we had a, a, a helpful etymology for that word. Come passio, uh, with suffering with another. And that's a beautiful lesson and a beautiful teaching and in the best case scenario meeting someone else's and our own meeting someone else's suffering with openness with availability with loving kindness as the basis we will naturally be spurred into action and if we are letting compassion guide us we will be able to spontaneously meet this situation, this person, this experience on its own terms. Without an agenda, without a pre-planned scheme. But also I want to mention that compassion can also be understood as availability. So compassion as meeting another's suffering very nicely you're available for them or meeting your own suffering. You're available for it. You don't turn away. You don't shut down. You don't other. You stay open. You stay and don't know. How, how can I help? And sometimes it's even just that. Also, uh, just briefly, there are no others. So compassion, maybe more expansively, I offer it to you to think of compassion as availability. Thanks to Tim for talking about Avalokiteshwara Bodhisattva. This is, we were talking about the 11 heads and 1,000 hands and eyes in each hand. This at my count, that's 11 heads, 1,000 hands, and 1,022 eyes. And why? Infinite ways of relating. Infinite availability. Infinite skillful means to meet the person suffering, to meet the situation, to meet the destructive, toxic system that predisposes beings into suffering with total availability. Endless, skillful means. After all, who is this Dharma for? If not for this precious earth and all of her precious creatures, including you, and everyone you've ever known, and anyone you will ever know, and every friend, every stranger, every family member, every loved one, every enemy, every person who hates you. It's for them. Why would the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and all their countless spiritual children proclaim kindness, compassionate care, joy at the joy of others, and equanimity as the hallmarks, banners, crowning glory, royal path, and only real purpose of all who would follow in their footsteps? It says in one refuge prayer that I love, Unfailing three jewels, please pay heed to me. I and all limitless sentient beings filling the infinite sky are from the very beginning essentially Buddha. The full presence of knowing that this is how we are reveals the mind as limitless, perfect awakening. 
I and all beings filling the sky. Think of how many beings have lived, how many are living now, and how many will live. And all of these, essentially Buddha, having the same nature. Collective achievement. All of us together, arising together as Buddha. Already, always. The Dharma presents a world and a world populated by beings who are utterly precious, boundless, ungraspable patternings of energy embedded in and embodying a play of an infinite patterning of cosmic energy. This might as well be Neil deGrasse Tyson or Stephen J. Hawking. It happens to be my teacher, James Lowe. How then can we truly embody that great compassion, which is the caring, living embodiment of that wisdom? I'm sure you're all familiar with the Hippocratic Oath. It's the oath that doctors have to, well, I, mean, I don't know if they still do, but I imagine they have to say, based on the teachings of the probably mythical Greek figure of Hippocrates, the first thing, the first line of the Hippocratic Oath is, first, do no harm. Imagine a doctor walking in, and instead of asking you, how are you today? What brings you to me today? How can I help? They say, oh, sit down, shut up, I've got something for you. And hand you a bottle of pills or schedule you for surgery without even talking to you at all. That would be silly and dangerous, to say the least. While we may not be doctors, we can do real harm when we think we have the world and the people in it all figured out. I know what you need. I'm going to sort you right. I get real clear about what everybody in the world needs to do when they piss me off. So strange. Um, one of my teachers says, don't have a plan, a scheme. Don't co cook up a program. Do not relate to others as if you know what they need and you're going to sort them and how they should be grateful to you. It's almost like killing them. Blinded by assumptions, views, prejudices, I turn infinitely unique, ungraspable, boundless, infinite expressions of cosmic energy into caricatures, and we see it every day. I'm kind of on a news ban because I saw a whole bunch of beautiful people talking about people that they look very much alike and talking about how they must be exterminated and you would be hard pressed to figure who they were talking about. Switch out the nouns and verbs, and it could be anyone. So what to do? A teacher once was asked, I have decided to go home for the holidays and I'm terrified about dealing with my family, what can I do? You've probably heard this before. The teacher answered, do not make them in the first place. Don't create them in the first place. Whatever the picture you have in your head of this family that you're going to meet, don't cook up how they're going to be in the first place. Can you go there and be vulnerable? Can you meet them as they are? A famous Chan teaching says, aiming to return to your roots, you should vary in accordance with things like a mirror and you should not follow rigid models. The mirror of awareness, utterly <coughs> lucid and faithful, it reflects only what is there, having no agenda and no plan, just reflecting true. It seems that we can only truly be of benefit to ourselves and others. Think about how complicated you are. How much more mysterious is someone else? I won't ever know why someone says something to me, really. How could I ever know? 
They are a completely unexplored universe. And they're telling themselves about me. Whether it's, I liked your talk, or you're a terrible person. Either way, they're telling me about how they are right now. They're relating to me. And even that is so mysterious. We can only truly be a benefit to ourselves and others. We can only truly care for ourselves and others when we come from a place of openness, of responsiveness, of don't know. Meeting the moment where it is, fresh, uncooked, raw, and wriggling, without scripts or preconceived notions. It is through participation that we reveal ourselves to one another, that we are revealed to ourselves even, through the gate of curiosity, using the key of vulnerability, we enter this kingdom of boundlessness again and again. Every sit, every breath, every bow, every word, every moment. And in the end, what is it all for? I'll leave you with an ancient Dharma song. Uh, imagine an ukulele. I don't play it very well, but you'll get it. What do we got you for? What do we got me for? Why do we have stars above? Oh, you know, I know everything's made for love. Why do we have teachers? Why do we have preachers? Why do we say lovey dove? Oh, you know, I know everything's made for love. Everything's made for love. Thank you very kindly for your attention. Was that 30 minutes? Should I take a question? Oh. If anybody has any questions that I can answer, or maybe even better ones I can't, um, I am available. Thank you kindly. familiar with that explicit citation in the suttas, uh, but it stands to reason based on what we know about the first jhana. I can't he's imagine why. So he's still thinking. He's, oh yeah, um, very skillfully yeah. navigating. I can't imagine why not. Right, okay. Second jhana different because you lose Vitaka Vichara and you're no longer it, like with concepts and discursive mm -hmm. thinking, but my understanding was, so is that a goal that we should be trying to always be in the first jhana? Oh gosh. To I, the Buddha? I, wow. I, I don't know. That's really, that's a big, that's a, I guess if you're going to shoot for the rhino, really go for it. But uh, that, uh, anytime I get a jhana question, um, I kind of want to defer because it's such a, um, it's such a, big thing. It's such a lofty goal and it gets even loftier even and through the commentaries. You know, the the jhanas and the suttas are very real are a lot smaller. There's four. And then yeah. the commentaries there's eight. 
Yes. And and even, and Buddha Gosha and the later commenters get really excited, and, and that's how things get, right? You get a little time on your hands, and time to develop these things. But um, uh, I, I I imagine the goal for someone small like me would be to uh, to cultivate loving kindness and compassion. My hunch is that. Um, my hunch is that the first jhana will naturally present itself by pursuing good conduct, kindness, compassion, and getting a scent, getting a taste for that joy of release that comes the more we let go. So I imagine it would be, it might even be counterproductive to turn the first jhana into a goal when all the jhanas are direct products of you know think about the jhana being i'm paying so much attention to the breath i get to this elevate this is a way it's commonly thought of and all the enlightened people online this is what they talk like the jhanas are like you get so rec so collected and so concentrated that you you know enter these elevated concentrated states but uh because you are paying so much attention to this one thing, right? The other side of that is you're letting the entire universe go. If you're paying attention to your breath and your conduct is good and your motivation is right and you love all beings and you want to serve, you can see it's a lot, right? But yeah, if you can let the entire cosmos go except following this thread of release, the bliss of release, and following the breath like a thread, then for sure, absolutely, first John all the way. But I'll let you know in like a hundred thousand lifetimes when I get there. Thank you. Yes, my dear. What is the, what is the first? Jhana? Jhana. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing for way more. It's a it's a thing f for people to argue about online. It's a it's a there is a, there are these four. Uh, the Buddha talks about these four basically levels of concentrated states that um, pursuing you know, the, which can be seen as the natural outgrowth of practice, that you get this more and more secluded from mental chatter and reactive mind and just m softer, 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 like that. But the suttas I like, the Buddha talks that the jhanas are their product of good conduct. Those are the suttas I like, or the jhana is a product of pleasure. The Buddha says that all over the suttas, I love it. He says, oh, um, the jhanas are not a product of concentration. That would be silly. The jhanas are a product of pleasure. Why? Because our heart-mind naturally will follow the pleasure of release that comes from a heart that is working for the good of all beings, whose conduct is good, who is always reflecting, how can I let go here? Am I, am I, what am I, oh. I can, I can, like that. So, uh, there's a lot of fully enlightened people online who have a lot of opinions about it, and they're way smarter than me. So, I'm just working on clear mind. <laughs> God, let me. That, I'm your student. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Um, our uh, our emptiness in anatta or, or not self. Like a same, the same idea from a different perspective, or or uh, like I, I just I'm not as familiar yeah. with Zen, and I don't yeah. like the emphasis on emptiness versus yeah. three characters. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the way one way you could look at it is you're from you're familiar with at least the name Nagarjuna, right? Mm -hmm. So the historical Buddha, at least in the suttas, uh, only really talked about, never really said emptiness. Dun dun. It was empty of a self, empty of what belongs to a self, 
empty of clinging and craving. It's always empty of something. Um, so one way to look at it is imagine the Buddha as this kindly old grandfather that had an old sports car in a barn. And the Garjuna was his like hot shot 16 year old grandson who found the keys and was like, let's see what this baby can do. And just ran with it. So I'm of the opinion that it very naturally follows. Well, if this is empty of a self and what belongs to a self, and this is empty of a self and what belongs to a self, and it's constantly changing, and it's dependently originated, and it's utterly embedded with everything, that's how Nagarjuna actually defines emptiness. Constantly changing, dependently originated, absent of a self. So this whole Mahayana parade uh, party uh, was started by someone who very much thought they were directly in line with the Buddha's Anatta teachings, Nagarjuna. So it's just, I, I would say it's just a different way of talking about it and thinking about it and practicing with it. Thank you, great question. Yes, sir. As someone who has the pleasure of hearing your words more than anybody else, uh, I edit his videos. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I, I must thank you, and I was truly moved. Thank you. Thank you very kindly. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, again, my sincere uh, gratitude and um, I, I can't believe I'm even allowed to be here, let alone asked to give a talk. Thank you very kindly.